Hello, and welcome to this Analyst Angle, where we are going to dive into the state of software development, open source, and CVEs. I'm Rob Stretche, and today we're going to look into how organizations are building their applications for their cloud operating model and in a cloud native way, and what the impact is on using open source in that development, and the trends on the security and the implications for those applications. Today, I'm joined by Jonathan Simpkins, who's the CEO and co-founder of COSI, and I'm welcoming you to the show, man. Great to have you on board. I get you guys, really, I know you and me actually have lived very similar lives where we've both been on, on the end user side, uh, you know, consumers of the technology, and then been at various different vendors across the years. So, uh, you know, great to have you on board. Thanks, Rob, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be here today. So why don't you kind of, you know, give us a little bit about the origin story about COSI and, you know, how you became part of the founding team there? Yeah, um, I guess I'll start with our mission statement, which is COSI exists to unleash the potential of open source software by giving open source maintainers the opportunity to live off their work and software developers the opportunity to rely on its security. Um, what led me to that? began when I founded a cybersecurity startup in the uh, early 2016. Um, we were acquired that same year, actually. And then I was an executive at a couple more cybersecurity companies in the zero trust and third party cyber risk management spaces. Um, and immediately prior to COSI, I was the CFO at Ubuntu, um, which really exposed me to the commercial side of open source, you know, which I married together with my background in cybersecurity. Um, when I was there, I kind of saw this unfilled gap in the market between producers of open source code and business consumers of that same code. Um, and it really should be simple because businesses want to access the innovation that you find in open source and open source maintainers want their, to see their work proliferate. They love seeing people pick it up. They love seeing usage increase. Um, and it's not just tech companies, you know, many businesses in many industries want to access this innovation base. Uh, as an example, prior to founding my first startup, I worked at HSBC. At one point when I was there, uh, HSBC was the third largest software developer in the world, if you count by engineer headcount. Um, and we were huge consumers of open source, but it created a lot of problems for us. Uh, government regulations and customers demand businesses manage their supply chains. Uh, but many maintainers of open source code are volunteers, and they're unable to provide the same sort of support you get from a commercial vendor like a Microsoft or an Oracle. Um, so we founded COSI last year to fill this gap. Uh, we want to effectively be the adapter that allows these two communities to make a solid connection. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we do a lot in the open source community. We're always at KubeCon. In fact, uh, the Cube has been there since the days it was called DockerCon, uh, you know, going all the way back over 13 years now. When you start to look at open source development, uh, like you said, I, I've been there, uh, multiple of my uh, companies have, you know, used open source pretty prolifically underneath the hood. Uh, and, you know, enterprises are now in kind of, hey, somebody came in, they used the package, they started to build it out and built out their applications, but, you know, they left. And so that knowledge went out, then it's, it's you know, an S-bomb or, you know, software bill of materials is is not enough uh, to get them through. What are you seeing from the current state of open source software and from that enterprise consumer perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think the first thing I'll do is, is effectively ignore it by talking about the past. So decades ago, people started to notice that most enterprise applications had at least some open source in it. And back then the primary issue when it comes to open source for business leaders was really kind of a license compliance question. Hey, you know, if I put this in my software, is it, am I going to get sued? Am I allowed to do this? Um, but now kind of over three quarters of the entire enterprise code base is open source. Sure. The average application has 526 different open source projects inside it. It looks nothing like it did two decades ago. Um, and despite this high base, open source adoption is still growing very rapidly. You think it kind of has topped out and can't, can't grow any faster, but it seems to keep doing it. And this is because this is where all the innovation is and businesses always need to innovate. Um, 
right now, AI is currently driving this. Uh, before that, it was augmented reality. Before that, it was blockchain. You know, maybe the next thing that moves the needle will be quantum computing. Hard to say. What what you can say with certainty is that the next thing is going to be an open source, and every business is going to have to take another step change increase in their adoption of it. Um, as a result, the primary open source issue for business leaders right now isn't isn't a license, a legal compliance issue anymore. It's a software supply chain risk that they need to manage, especially cybersecurity issues. And this is because, in my opinion, you know, technology risk management and cybersecurity were born in a world that was a proprietary software world. These aren't new functions. They didn't start a couple of years ago. Um, but now we're all living in an open source world. And those things aren't quite tailored to function in that new world. Um, some brief stats on the issue that businesses are facing right now, 84% of the enterprise code base contains at least one known open source vulnerability. 74% uh, of those are high risk vulns, um, which is a big increase from where it was in 2022, just a couple of years ago when only 48% were high risk. But this is what happens when you get, you know, a big innovation needle mover like AI, it's, it's all brand new stuff and it hasn't been secured yet. Um, and 91% of enterprise apps use extremely out of date open source or straight up abandonware. Um, you know, that's a scary number. It's not 9%, it's 91%. That means the vast majority of the code, you know, nobody is supporting it anymore. There isn't a patch coming, you know, a big breach happens. There's no cavalry over the hill. Um, so I'd say the current state is that enterprise software is open source software. There's no real distinction anymore. Um, and enterprise software supply chains are deteriorating in terms of safety. And that's probably because they're getting much, much stronger in terms of content. You know, there's a lot more varieties of orange juice on the open short source shelf now. Um, but may, you know, maybe the FDA is falling behind in that analogy. Yeah, no, I, I, I think we, I like that analogy, the orange juice. <laughs> I, 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 I'm a no pulp guy. So it's yeah, like, <laughs> but, but I look at it and cause I, I think when you, when you look at security, it's always a, uh, you know, there's never enough people. You can't just throw bodies at it. It's and we we've, we've been trying this, and we've been hearing about shift left for years. And really, kicking the ca can down the road is what you're doing with that. It really doesn't fully address the core issues. What have you been hearing from customers about what they want from their developers to really integrate security into the development process effectively? What what are kind of they looking for to wrap that process in? Because right now, shift left is, you know, basically I'm going to ignore it and hope that somebody else does does the job for me in many cases. Yeah, well, I think, you know, shift left, it makes sense from an organizational perspective, you know, and hypothetically is going to reduce the overall work hours you're putting in to produce the same results by shifting work to a place where it's more efficient and it's going to generate less rework. And that's the primary source of inefficiency. It's, it's eliminating rework before it gets created. Um, the problem is that that is from an organizational perspective and kind of to your point from the developer perspective, you know, shift left sounds a lot like delegation. You know, this wasn't my job. I didn't sign up for this. Suddenly you're, you're making me do, you know, this stuff that I consider kind of dull and tedious work. So while, you know, the overall company will benefit, um, the work generally gets shifted completely out of the original owner of that work to a, to a new group that, that doesn't want to do it, quite frankly. Um, and so if, if it's badly managed, shift left can lead to attrition, you know, and it's hard to replace human resources. These aren't people you really want to lose. So, you know, I think a lot of organizations are sensitive to effectively you know, offending this group of people, asking them to do stuff that they that's not in their original job description. Um, and that's, I think that's when shift left is, sounds a lot more like kicking the can down the road, um, as you put it. So, you know, that said, you know, the, the concept itself is still sound um, and security does need to be seamless to be efficient. You know, you can elect to have inefficient security if you want, and then, you know, all bets are off, do what you want there. And you know, it's just going to require a bigger, bigger budget and more people to get it done. Um, but if you take a step back again to that developer perspective, they are under an immense pressure to deliver features quickly. And when there's bugs and open source CVEs and other tech debt, 
in their way, you know, that's just simply not going to happen. And this is the thing, devs actually want to deliver features quickly. That's why most of them chose that profession. Um, and so I think a well-run engineering organization strives to deliver that employee experience to their software developers. And so to answer your question, I think at the root, what customers are asking us for is help delivering that. If you really boil it down to the to the base issue there. Um, and our value prop at COSI is really to to customers is, hey, keep keep shifting it left. Shift it left right out of your organization and to us. We want to do this work. You know, your your devs don't. Your product managers don't want dev cycles spent on it. You know, your business leaders don't want uh, delays to the execution of their strategy. Um, so, you know, keep keep shifting the left right on out the door. Um, you know, and, and what we're offering really is an easy button to kind of get your developers back to doing what they want to do. And, and, and that's what the product managers and the leadership team wants them to do as well. Um, so it's not a new problem either. I mean... I would ask people to think back, you know, how many product launches were significantly day delayed because of Heartbleed? You know, again, not a new problem. And 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 not a not a one off either, you know. Look, we can pivot that to more recently and I know remediation work is still ongoing, but how many were delayed because of Log4 shell? Um so what we're doing here at Cosi is we're kind of it's not a new problem, but we're offering a new solution. And I believe that's why our platform is resonating with our customers because and there's nobody who who looks at the problem and says, no, I, I I want my devs to be unhappy and unproductive because there's a mountain of you know open source CVEs that they need to close instead of building new features for us. Yeah, no, I I couldn't agree more. I think that to that point, uh, having managed devs and been the uh, head of product for a couple companies, and you know you sit there and I you know I had three pillars, you know, new net new features, improving. Uh, other features and, you know, kind of how do we, you know, address, I, I called it tech debt, even though it wasn't necessarily tech debt all the time, but how do you address CVEs? And, you know, it was 30, 30, 30, a lot of times across that of, of my devs time was being spent in each of those buckets. Yeah. And, and to your point, not one dev ever called me and said, you know what, I want to ship insecure code. And I'm, I'm really aiming to ship insecure code. And more of it was about, hey, how do, I, how, do I, how do I get this and what tools can I use to really get to this point faster so that I'm not spending 30% of my time. I spend 15% of my time on that and really bring out robust, secure code and fix what needs to be fixed uh, you know, before the bad guys know that I have it in there and target me. Um, and, you know, that kind of leads me to, you know, what do you see as the current state of tools and practices that are available to help these developers, you know, manage these vulnerabilities today? Because to me, uh, you know, I'm on CISA's email. I get that every morning and, you know, it's a, it's a blast to wake up to and see, <laughs> hey, you know, this, this thing that I use is compromised or this thing that I know, these, this large company that, you know, has all my money is uh, compromised. You know, it it definitely you know is uh, you can be CVE'd to death, to put it mildly. And in fact, I was having we got audited. Uh, you know, we we have customers, and we got audited by one of them. And they asked us how do we deal with the CVEs. And I went through the process of how we do, and you know, the different triage and at the different you know using uh, you know best practice for which the severities and things of that nature. But there's so much that that is there's so many tools and there's so many practices out there. What do what do you see as kind of that, you know, what people should be leaning into these days? Yeah, I mean, as well, the first thing I'll say is uh, I think we use that 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 same product uh, in reverse. I use it as a sleep aid, not to, not to wake up in the morning. Um, but yeah, as I as I alluded to earlier, um, kind of in my view, at least most of the tools and practices are tuned to that that world where they were born in where there's a commercial vendor behind all the elements of your software supply chain um and from where i sit the current state of that is relatively strong when there is a vendor to partner with you know nobody's nobody knows a block of code like like the company that produced that block of code um so at a minimum, I would argue that investing even more in securing your vendor backed software stack even better is likely going to offer you a poor return. Uh, it's not that it can't be better, it can't get better. It's just not where kind of your weakest link is, which I think is 
you know, lots of analogies in the security world, but I think that's one of the more relevant ones. Um, so I would encourage everyone kind of to shore up your open source fortifications before you get even better at something you're probably pretty good at already. Um, and I'd say most legacy tools are focused on this, this space, you know, would have been great two decades ago when open source was more question like, is there any open source in this application or not? Not, you know, this is three quarters of the application and which 500 plus different things are in here. Um, and so I think a modern program that works in today's environment, honestly consists of, of I think five key elements, at least in my opinion. And, and, and I'll, I'll kind of list them out in what I think is the order of impact. So the first thing I would, I would recommend people do is implement, you know, a rigorous security practice. Most businesses are already doing this, you know, CISO is not a, a rare role. It's not a new role. Um, and, and this is what a CISO spends most of their time doing. Um, and most of the, most of these programs already kind of have open source in scope. So there's not really much not being done here, quite frankly. So I would, you know, move to step two now, which is it's really leverage the commercial support that's available. So some open source projects do have commercial vendors behind them, you know, whether it's your Linux vendor, like a Red Hat, um, or an application vendor, like a Databricks, um, you businesses should absolutely engage with those vendors when when that option exists. Um, number three, I'd say, is adopt the security tools that are out there. Um, there's a lot of AppSec tools that are focused, you know, specifically on open source, um, like SCA products. Uh, I particularly like, you know, what Sonatype is doing and what Black Duck is doing. Um, number four, I would say, you know, establish an open source program office. And this is where I think you're really moving into best practice territory. If you have uh, an OSPO, you are definitely way ahead of the curve. Um, and I'd recommend, you know, if this is a new concept to you, look into this into this group called the To Do Group. It's T O D O Group um, for help on this. It's an industry organization, and it really is about evangelizing what an OSPO is, and you know how to implement one in your in your business. Um, and then, kind of finally, step five, kind of closing the loop, is you need to engage back with the community. Now, if you have an OSPO, they'll manage this for you. Um, and once you have started doing this, you know, in my view, you've essentially reached, you know, open source nirvana. Um, and what look, what we're trying to do at Cosi is is effectively be that commercial support, that step two, uh, for all the unsupported open source that exists. So before Cosi, that wasn't an option. As far as I'm aware, we are the first company offering to support, you know, extremely outdated versions of open source and abandoned wear. Um, and so for the first time, what we're offering customers is a future where they don't have a remainder in step two, where, you know, there's a block of their tech stack that they can't execute step two against. Um, you know, and so we're, we're, we're getting a lot of people pretty excited about that as a result. Yeah, I, I think that's key is that abandonware and like, I, again, I think we we were joking when we were talking, you know, previously when uh, back in the days when I was uh, with a, a company I won't mention, uh, you know, we had NT4 there and we were paying for security patches from Microsoft for years after NT4 wasn't usable anymore, uh, yeah. which is just absolutely insane. And I, I think part of it also was, you know, we couldn't move the code because, uh, you know, the person was gone from the company and now Gen AI may help that, but Gen AI introduces a whole bunch of other things like CVEs itself into there where it's been trained. And we were, I know, chatting about that previously. Yeah, I never met a, I never met a sales guy who doesn't love the phrase end of life because they know that some subset of their customer base can't migrate and is going to need to pay a lot yes. to keep some sort of out of, out of life support from the, from that vendor going. Uh, Those are pretty lucrative deals when you're in the sale business. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I, I remember having five years to support stuff until uh, you know end of end of life, end of end of support, all of that stuff. But I, I think bringing it back to kind of the developers, what what do you think are some of the strategies that could be you know employed to help you know eliminate or reduce that developer frustration with you know kind of. They, they always have more security pressure on them all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I would, I would kind of, I might sound a bit like a broken record here, but what, what I would recommend is that engineering leadership really needs to internalize that their team doesn't want to be doing this kind of work. 
um, at least more than the particular individual on the team thinks is necessary, which, you know, is a, everyone has a slightly different opinion on that. Um, and you need to really make that as the leadership team, your North star. Um, I've never, I mean, we talked about this as well, but I've never met a software developer that wants to write bad code. You know, that's not what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but if they wanted to be security experts, they, they would be cyber engineers and they'd, they'd work on the CISOs team, not on the CTOs team. Um, you know, most software developers that I've met are creative types and they want to build things. Um, it's like that old line from uh, pretty woman. Uh, you know, I think where it's, it's Richard Gere, if I'm remembering my actor's names correctly, says when I was a kid, I liked to play with Legos, not Monopoly. Well, these guys like their Legos. I mean, behind me, you can see a bunch of Legos, you know, we're builders. Um, you know, so I think if they're not building things that are new features where you can see it on the screen when they're done and there's a new button that you can click and it does something cool, they're not going to be happy. Um, and you want to maximize the time that they have in their calendar to do that. And it has a tremendous knock-on effect for the rest of your organization. It's not just going to result in a happier, more productive developer. You know, your product managers are going to be happier because their initiatives are going to launch faster. Uh, your leadership team is going to be happier because their strategies are going to get executed faster. And your shareholders are going to be happier because you're going to grow faster. Um, so when you can outsource anything that isn't building new features, you know, do it, do it immediately. Um, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't hire an army of engineers to kind of insource Linux support. You, you pay SUSE or Canonical or Red Hat for that. Um, and you, you know, so don't implicitly do that when there are other vendors out there that can support non-core competency activities for you as well. Um, you know, and that said, I will say, you know, don't just buy everything under the sun. The, the budget for that doesn't exist. And quite frankly, there's nothing that frustrates a developer more than, you know, another new mandatory tool that they have to train on and they have to use. And it doesn't help them really do their job at all. Or even worse, it doesn't even work. Um, you know, so, you know, don't rush to just like get a shopping list together either, but talk to your developers, you know, analyze your JIRA data. You know, that data is all there for you. Um, you know, learn what's eating into their calendar uh, or consuming sprint cycles that is an additive to your product managers. Uh, you know, and that should really help leadership prioritize, you know, what to outsource next, which should lead you directly to the to the right tools and vendors that focus on that specific thing that you've identified. You know, every business is going to be different. So there's not, you know, some one size fits all recommendation there. Um, you know, do the work to to deliver that employee experience, you know, that North Star I talked about at the beginning. Yeah. No, I think that's a great place to leave this. I think, Jonathan, I want to thank you for coming on board. It's always interesting diving into where you guys are kind of at the tip of that spear with these folks and CVEs, and there's just a mountain of open source that's out there. So thanks for coming on board. Oh, my pleasure, Rob. Pleasure to talk to you today. And thank you for joining this Analyst Angle, where we were breaking down CVEs, open source, and the state of software development, stay tuned to The Cube, the leader in tech analysis and news. See you soon.